Uh, with the word now, uh, it's fantastic to be with you. My name is Nick Drake, one of the pastors here. If we haven't met, especially if you're new to church, it's fantastic to have you in the building. If you're watching online, hello, I know a lot of the students are watching online. Hello, it's fantastic to have you with us as well. And it's really exciting to be starting a whole new series today that is going to be running all through the summer. And this series is called Stories of Old. Stories of Old. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament stories in light of the new, in light of Jesus. We hope to show in this series how the Old Testament is fuel for our worship and foundational for our faith and for deepening our discipleship, so our desire to follow closely Jesus. We want to show how important the Old Testament is, how the Old Testament reveals more fully who Jesus is and what he has done for us on the cross. We think um, one of the most famous stories of Jesus' resurrection after his resurrection is called the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 when he appears alongside two of his followers and he basically explains to them through the Old Testament who he is. He does a mini Bible study Uh, And I love that story, and we think that many of the insights that then appear in the rest of our New Testament about the Old Testament come from that Bible study. They come from Jesus. And so some of what we're going to learn today and through this series, we think we can trace back from Jesus on that road to Emmaus Bible study. So it's a really exciting topic. And we start today at the very beginning with Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 to 3, and in particular, I'm going to focus on Adam today. Now, did you know, for example, that Adam uh, was the first what is called taxonomist? A taxonomist, not someone who does taxes, but someone who names things, naming all the animals. Anyone here name anything they own? Cars? Anyone name their own car? Yes, come on. Mine's called Bert. The other one's called Ernie. Any, anyone else name anything? Any teddy bears people have got, for example, ever named? Yeah. Apparently, 25% of us name our cars, so I think some of you aren't being honest with me in in this room online. So that was Adam, and then Adam and Eve, obviously one of the most famous stories. Sometimes we groan, we're like, oh yeah, I've heard all this before, and I don't know if you've ever had that playground joke, you know, did Adam have a belly button, those kind of deep questions. No? Um, So... um, But I hope to show some fresh insights today as we read this story together, because Understanding Adam is super, super important for our faith. Why? Because in some way, he is us. He is us. To fully understand the good news of Jesus, we need to first understand the bad news of Adam, of our human tendency to get things Wrong, And I'm sure all of us in the room and online know that tendency well, that Adam is us, that tendency to mess things up. We're going to see today that the Old Testament is not just old, but can lead us now by the Spirit into something new through Jesus. So come with me. We've got a fair little bit to go through in Genesis, if you've got a Bible, or it'll be on the screen, because I'm going to skip through, so it might be easier just to follow it on the screen, but do have a Bible out if you want to follow it there. I'm going to go through the story of Genesis 1 to 3, but just land on three passages uh, because of time with us. We're going to dive in, first of all, to Genesis 1. God has created the world, he's created all the animals, and he sees that it's good, but something is missing. Verse 26, then God said... Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now we're going to jump to Genesis 2, verse 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. 
Now we're going to skip to chapter 3. Chapter 3 is where it all goes wrong. It all goes wrong. The woman, is, Eve, is tempted by a serpent to eat the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. And she gives some to Adam, who also eats it. And they realize at this point that they're naked for the first time. And so they hide in fear and shame from God. Has anyone ever done that? They hide in fear and shame from God. But God, of course, finds us. And so let's leap to verse 21 of chapter 3. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. First of all, two quick things. One, notice that something already has had to die. This animal clearly has had to die to clothe them, consequence of the sin. Secondly, note the care and kindness of God, even in this moment, that he considers to clothe them. That's his first move, to serve them even though they've disobeyed him. Verse 22, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. So that's a whistle-stop tour of, the, of kind of some of the key mountain peaks of Genesis one to three, I do encourage you to read it all later if you've never read it or if you haven't read it for a long time. What we're going to do now is look at how we can understand these stories of old in the light of Jesus. And in theology, in studying the Bible, this is called typology. Typology. It's where an element of the Old Testament prefigures something of the new. It can be a person, in this case Adam. It can be an event, for example, crossing the Red Sea. A freedom, a freedom from slavery event like the crosses for us. It can be a thing or an item. But the link between Adam and Jesus is one of the strongest we have as we study the Bible. Why? Because in the New Testament, Jesus is literally talked of as a second Adam or last Adam. Uh, put it on the screen there, 1 Corinthians 15. And Adam, likewise, in Romans 5, is talked of as a pattern or a type of what was to come, i.e. Jesus. So the Adam-Jesus link is one of the strongest types we have of reading the Old Testament in light of the New and vice versa. So I'm going to take us through three areas to show how this is important for our lives. So come with me. You might want to take some notes on these three areas before we land together. First of all, image. Image. We saw in Genesis 1 that Adam and Eve are made in the image of God, of the invisible God. They are made in his image. That tells us that we, all of us sitting here today watching online, we're designed to have intrinsic worth, that our worth isn't from what we do or how we behave, but our worth is just built in that we are worth something because God says we're worth something. We're made in his image. You are worth so much. Even if you don't feel it today, the goodness of God is in you. You're made in his image. So we're made in his image, but also we're made to radiate, therefore, to shine who God is. Wherever we go, we're made to display who God is. But because of Adam and Eve's choice to take the fruit and eat it, this image is broken. If you've ever dropped a mirror and it cracks and then you look in it, it doesn't quite look like you anymore, right? It's broken. It's a strange image that looks back at you. And that's what's happened. Not a true picture of who God is anymore. Yes, there's goodness in us all, but there's all sorts of darkness and mess. We are a broken reflection of God because Adam is us, remember. He is us. But now on to Jesus. Well, Jesus likewise in Colossians 1.15 is spoken of as the image of the invisible God. It's the same language. And in Hebrews 1.3, it goes on to say that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. The exact representation. The radiance of God's glory. And in Colossians 1.19, it says that the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. Not just like a half measure, not just like a broken image bit, but like the fullness of God can be seen in Jesus. The full image, perfect. 
And it radiates out from who Jesus is in contrast to who Adam is. Jesus came to us because he was in the business of restoring this broken image. How does he restore this broken image? How does he have the power to restore? Romans 5, 19. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And so through Jesus' obedience, despite our ongoing brokenness and imperfection, we are made righteous, restored relationship with God, restored intimacy. His obedience reverses the first Adam's disobedience. So that's image. What about the next um, area we can look at? Legacy. I've called this legacy. A legacy. You see, when Adam and Eve sin, when they disobey God, the consequences, the legacy they leave behind, so what they put into the world is bad. It's actually pretty heavy stuff. Romans 5, again, says this in verse 12 and 14. Sin entered the world through one man, which is Adam, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Death, verse 14 now, reigned from the time of Adam. So when Adam and Eve eat this fruit, it's not just like they do something bad, but it's like they open the way for a virus to come in to the human system. A virus that cannot be fixed by us. Something has changed forever from the time of Adam onwards. Sin and death. Separation from God. If you notice at the end of the story, Genesis 3, they're sent out of the Garden of Eden. They're sent out of intimacy. They're sent away from direct, close contact with the Lord. Jesus comes, and whereas Adam leaves behind death in the world, the second Adam, Jesus, when he comes to earth, it's almost like he sets his targets on destroying what the first Adam left behind. Isn't that amazing? He comes, he's like, death and sin, they're my targets. I am going to go after these two. Isn't that amazing? Like, we get so distracted, don't we? Don't you get distracted? You know, you've got your job to do, you've got family to look after or friends to see. You, you know, you've got all this stuff. Jesus, I don't think he was distracted. It's like laser sharp precision. The first Adam has left behind sin and death. And that stops humans, us, flourishing and living the life God called us. So Jesus comes in his kindness and yet mighty power, I'm going to destroy those two things so that my people can live free again. So that the Garden of Eden intimacy can be restored again. So the image of God in every one of us can shine and radiate the goodness of God again. I don't want to live with broken mirrors that reflect a broken God to the world. I want to restore it all. And so I'm going to come in power and destroy sin and death on the cross and so, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, In Adam we all die, but in Christ we're all made alive. And I don't know if you're sitting here today, if you're watching online, and maybe you feel you've left a trail of mess, like Adam and Eve, a bit of a, a legacy that you're not proud of, or the, the message today. The, the only thing you need to hear is Jesus can come and change that legacy, like he did. He can come in the power of the cross and change. It's never too late to change what you're going to leave behind in this world. Thirdly, and finally, rule. Rule. Adam was created with Eve in the image of God. In the image was a role, and the role was to rule, to name things, to bring order out of chaos in the world, to reflect who God is in the way God works in the world, to rule, to partner with God. The first humans were commissioned to fill the earth, to subdue it. But Adam and Eve reject God's way. They think they know best. And so instead of humans ruling in partnership with God, 
death ruled, as we've already heard. That's pretty strong language, but that's the reality that the Bible tells us. Jesus comes, and Ephesians 1.20 says this to 23. God has raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. And Philippians 2.9 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So whereas Adam has limited dominion through his sin, Jesus just releases the reign and rule of the kingdom of God. All power over all things. And we... Now, following the second Adam, following the last Adam of Jesus, we're called to to reign with him, to be co-heirs with him. It's extraordinary. Like we're called in Romans 8 to to reign and rule with Jesus, the authority he's given us, not to be under anything, but to reign and rule with Jesus in the kingdom of God. So there's three headings, image, legacy, and rule that help show us how the first Adam and the second Adam contrast how they're like each other and yet fundamentally different. But what does this all mean for us? What's this all mean? Well, I thought at this point you'd need a little bit of light relief. So um, I better name this tune, okay? da 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 dum 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 Join in if you know it. da 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 dum Anyone shout it out? Adam's family. Uh, anyone? Come on. Anyone here? Now, this was on. This was, uh, this was, when I was growing up, the TV was still black and white, people. Like every so often, they still show this show, and it used to freak me out as a kid, I have to tell you. But as, as, and maybe you've seen more recent movies or on Netflix. Anyone watched that series Wednesday last year? Yeah, Wednesday, which um, is the Adam's family daughter, I think. Um, Wednesday, um, this family used to freak me out because I, I used to think they, I couldn't figure out what they were. Are they ghouls? Are they dead? There seems to be some debate online about what, they, what kind of people they are, but it definitely used to freak me out. And I know I wouldn't want to be part of this family. I certainly knew as a kid I didn't want to be part of this family. Thanks, you could take that off now. But in summary, and if the only thing you remember is we don't want to be a part anymore of Adam's family, right? That's what you need to remember from today. We don't want to be a part of Adam's family because the biblical Adam's family is, an, is, is a dead family. It's a dead family that just goes from dust to dust. It goes from dust to dust, Genesis 2, 7, Genesis 3, 19. Now, ironically, given the name of the daughter, Wednesday, Ash Wednesday service, if you've ever been in an Ash Wednesday worship service, it's one of the most powerful moments I've been in of worship, Ash Wednesday. Why? Because it's all about this Adam's family. It's all about dust to dust. And yet it expresses the change, the hope that Jesus brings into that dust to dust to to break us out. Listen to this. If you ever go to Ash Wednesday gathering, you come forward and you're marked on your forehead with a sign of the cross in ashes by the priest. And he says, he or she says this, blessed are you, God of all creation. You are eternal and we are mortal. We're formed from the dust of the earth. So as we receive these ashes, make them a sign for us of repentance and returning to you. Breathe into us again the breath of life. And as the ashes are marked on your forehead, the priest would say this, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. You see, if we just stay in the Adam family, We're trapped in the family line. 
from dust to dust, and worse than that, infected with a virus, sin. It's heavy, I know, but this is, this is, we need to grasp how bad Adam family is to get how good Jesus family is, right? There's no point just going on all the time about the goodness of Jesus if we don't also know the backdrop of how bad the Adam family is, that we're all trapped in unless Jesus comes to save us. Jesus comes to break us out. There is hope and the clue is in that liturgy. Turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. Turn away and be faithful to Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 says this, the first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Jesus is the heavenly man that we can all share in the gospel messages. There is a way out. There is a breakout. There is a born again new journey. We can be born again as humans restored. Redemption is a recreation event, a new genesis, a new birth into a new family, into a new kind of garden of intimacy and relationship with God. And if Adam is us, we can now say, when we choose to follow Jesus, Jesus is us. It's extraordinary. Jesus is us. Everything has changed by which we mean we can participate in his life, in his resurrection life, in his intimacy with the Father God. We escape Adam's family and we join Jesus' family because of what he's done on the cross. This is us. So the challenge as I come to land is if we see Christianity as a race maybe, it's the only race where you want to come second. You want to come Second, because that's where Jesus is. The second, Adam. And in a way, that expresses the key to what all of this talk is about. Placing your will, what you want, your desires, placing them not first, but second. That's the heart of the mistake that Adam and Eve made. We are to be a people who come second. Second, because that's where Jesus is, second to the Father's will. And how can we do that? Because Jesus has done it. It's not on us. Jesus has done it all through his life, submitting his will to the creator gods. And it climaxes where? It climaxes not on a cross, but the garden before the cross another garden, a second garden, where the second Adam corrects the mistake of the first. And in doing so, commits his path to the cross where he frees forever every human person on the planet. What a master plan. What a genius. What a humble king. Almighty, yet all love. And he comes today to free us and to free you. We don't want to have anything to do with the way of the first Adam. But Jesus saves. Adam is dead, but Jesus is alive. And you can be too. Amen. Shall we stand together in this place as the band come up? And first of all, I just want to give an opportunity for anyone who wants to say yes to Jesus for the first time. Maybe you just visited, someone's brought you along. Maybe you're watching online. I just want to give you an opportunity just to say, yes, I want to be in Jesus' family. I don't want to stay in Adam's family. I want to be in Jesus' family. So just with all our eyes closed, let's close our eyes in the room. And if that's you, if you know straight away, I want to follow this Jesus, or maybe you you haven't followed him for a long time and you want to come back in, it's fine if there's no one, but if there is anyone, I'm just going to ask you now, all eyes are closed, just to raise a hand. So now, go, just raise a hand if that's you, just across this room. Thank you, I see you near the front. Anyone else, I'll just leave it for 30 seconds. 
Thank you, I see you at the back. Thank you, I see you. Anyone else? Thank you, I see you midway back. And the rest of us all across this room, why don't we all raise our hands? Because we choose every day to follow Jesus. It's a sign, hey, Jesus, I, I, I need you. I choose you. I want to follow you. And I'm going to say this prayer out loud together. Join in if you want, especially if you put your hand up for the first time. It'll be on the screen. It goes like this. But all of us, why don't we all say this together? Thank you, God, for loving me before I ever loved you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you know me and you love me completely. I know I have made mistakes and now I ask for your total forgiveness. I turn away from everything I know is wrong. Today, I choose to put my faith in you and say yes to following you. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit now. Amen. And if you put your hand up for the first time earlier on, we just some of our team will come around and just give you a, a bag just to welcome you. It's got a little gospel in. It's got a flyer about Alpha course. You can um, follow up and learn more about the Christian faith. in the rest of us, why don't we just have a moment just to reflect, maybe make your own prayer in your heart. In a moment, we're going to move into communion. But what I encourage you to do in this moment of peace is just to pray for God's breath like that scripture from Ash Wednesday, breathe your breath into me. Breathe. Holy Spirit, come. Where I have been dead, come and bring new life. Maybe there's a particular area in your life. This past week, you know you need the breath of God to fill where you've been working out fear. You've been putting your own will first. It's a moment of surrender. But just have a moment or two just to respond to the Lord. And now we're going to say the words that come up on the screen as we take communion together, as we respond to this moment through receiving bread and wine together in this place. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. For in your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you didn't reject us, but you came to meet us in your son. You embraced us as your children. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice of sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and he gave you thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, Father. At the end of the supper, taking a cup of wine he gave you thanks and he said drink this all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins do this in remembrance of me as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory send your holy spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us gathered the body and blood of your dear son So with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise. We lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Let's declare this out, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. And now we have a moment to confess our sin. To confess where we too have been like Adam and Eve. Let's just have a moment. Almighty God, who forgives or truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Savior taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. So draw now near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. If the stewards would like to come forward, we're going to um, administer communion. Uh, just come forward to the station here. Um, and we're going to have stations to receive at the front set of each section. Uh, so do come out uh, and you come out with your hands open, we'll place a wafer in your hands and then you dip it in the wine uh, and then eat it. That's how we do it. Or um, We have gluten-free wafers here at the front and all the wine is non-alcoholic. And so um, as you're ready, if you'd like to come out, um, if you've got children who are here as well, hello, children, uh, come out as well. Uh, and we'd love just to pray a blessing on you, you as a family as well.